Over the centuries, the tower has gained a grim reputation. The murder of the princes in the tower, the execution of Lady Jane Grey, the torture of Guy Fawkes have helped give this place a bloody name. She heard footsteps, turned her head, on that moment he struck. And moved her head with one swipe. Anybody squeamish? He knelt down beside that prostrate body, removed his butcher's carving knife, and then proceeded to cut away the last stubborn sinews of flesh and gristle. Gory enough for you. But what really happened within these walls? This is the true story of execution and murder at the tower. The classic image of the tower execution, poised to deliver the fatal blow to the victim kneeling on a scaffold at the execution site. But how close to reality is this? The execution we know most about took place in the age of Queen Elizabeth I. In her reign, only one person was beheaded within these walls, the dashing Earl of Essex. He had been one of her greatest favourites, a national hero rumoured to be her lover. When he lost his head, it was the ultimate fall from grace. Essex's last days were written about in detail at the time, so the tower's curators can accurately piece together the anatomy of an execution, starting with the scaffold itself. We've got the vital kind of statistics here, haven't we? It was raised some four foot high and in breadth three yards, so it's... It's quite high off the ground and it's not that big being three yards broad. It does seem to be fairly kind of classic of having a raised floor like that, a wooden structure, having some very simple little steps going up to it and then there's room for about eight people max sort of thing on it. But then of course there's this. This startling woodcut is of the execution of the Earl of Essex. It provides some of the best clues, showing how the scaffold was set up and exactly how Essex died. It's published after his death. Although it's crude, it seems to match up with the descriptions rather well. If we did get somebody to, to make an exact copy, as close as we can get with this, these descriptions and these images and so on, of the scaffold, it would, be, it would be a really dramatic thing, wouldn't it, to have in the middle of the exhibition? Oh. I think it would really... <laughs> The plan is to recreate the scene of execution for a tower exhibition. The new scaffold is based on the original documents and made from solid oak. We know exactly what the tower authorities ordered 400 years ago for the death of Essex. It shall be some four foot high, in breadth three yards, and railed around with small poles. Before his dramatic fall from power, the Earl of Essex had been one of the most famous men in the country and exceptionally close to Queen Elizabeth. When they first met, she was well into her 50s. He was in his early 20s, full of ambition and self-confidence. It was reported that they spent hours in each other's company, flirting and playing cards late into the night. I have but my hearts to give to you, Your Majesty. Hearts bestowal. And yet again a spade, to dig myself into an early grave. And indeed, the card with which I have last, the Queen. Court gossip said that Essex rarely returned home before daybreak.
He was selfish, he was a show-off, he was badly behaved, he was out of hand in terms of the way that he conducted himself. However, he was all those things, really, because Elizabeth had let him be like that. It's almost like she was a terribly indulgent mother to a spoilt child who continually indulged their bad behaviour. And then, when she finally got fed up with it, blamed Essex. Essex's popularity and personality created many powerful enemies within the Queen's court. He was isolated. The aging Queen dropped him when his military adventures failed miserably. Everything came to a head on the 8th of February 1601, when in desperation to regain his earlier influence, Essex led a rebellion against Elizabeth's government. He hoped to capture the tower itself, but the revolt crumbled before it started. By that same evening, Essex was captured and taken down the Thames to be locked up in the tower. The charge, treason. The penalty, death. Once inside the tower, Essex pleaded for his life, but Queen Elizabeth turned her back. Work began to prepare for his death. For the exhibition, a replica of an executioner's axe is being made. It's basically a traditional woodsman's axe. There was no special design for cutting off an earl's head. Now, you want to see a demonstration? Hmm? Well, you're not going to. <laughs> In the wood workshop, the scaffold is nearing completion. Using Tudor joinery techniques, the whole scene is as accurate as possible. We were saying when they um, chopped the head off, not a very nice thing to think of, but there must have been a, a huge mess as well from the, the heart probably pumping out. But that's why the straw on it, and I suppose yeah. you just, it just kind of sweep it up. Oh, it was covered, the deck was covered in yeah, straw? We might do oh, that. right, okay. It's easy to imagine a very similar conversation taking place in 1601, just before the beheading of Essex. By the time the scaffold was finished, the Queen had decided his fate. In her palace, Elizabeth didn't hesitate to sign his death warrant. Four hundred years after the death of Essex, his scaffold is back at the tower. The replica is being put together for the exhibition inside the White Tower. But where within the tower's walls was the original setup? In preparation for the real execution of the Earl of Essex. For over a century, the famous scaffold site has been marked out for visitors. But is this the right spot? If you were to believe this sign, you would accept that the Earl of Essex was executed on this site in February 1601. However, the situation is far more complicated than that. And we know for sure that the Earl of Essex wasn't executed here. In fact, he was executed on the middle of the parade ground over there. And it's almost certain that Anne Boleyn was executed there as well. We know this from contemporary accounts, uh, which the people who marked this site out were unaware of. The confusion about the scaffold's location seems to date from a visit of Prince Albert to the tower in 1861. He told the Lieutenant Governor of the tower that the Queen, Queen Victoria, would be much pleased if the site of the execution of Anne Boleyn could be marked out. Armed only with an 18th century engraving of the execution of three members of the Black Watch, the authorities took this site. And it was duly marked out the following year, 1862, with a small brass plaque. The Royal Armouries have recently acquired a little-known document written by an anonymous eyewitness who described Essex's final hours in minute detail. The execution of Robert, late Earl of Essex, the 25th of February, within the Tower of London. Upon Ash Wednesday, in the morning at one of the clock, the Lieutenant of the Tower gave the Earl warning, as he was in his bed, 
to prepare himself for death, which would be that very day. All things were prepared for the execution within the tower by seven or eight o'clock. The Earl was brought to the scaffold that was placed in the high court above Caesar's tower. In the shadow of this tower, Essex prepared to meet his maker. His dying speech was carefully recorded. I desire you, my lords here present, to see my just punishment. The number of my sins are more than the hairs on my head. I pray you all, Pray with me that when you see my arms outstretched, my neck upon the block and the strike to be given, it may please God to send down his angels and lift up my soul to his mercy's seat. Executioner, strike home. The Earl patiently waited for the blow of the axe, though when it came, the executioner, quote, performed his office ill, and three strokes were needed before the head was severed. And so Queen Elizabeth's last favourite died. This woodcut shows just how Essex lost his head. He certainly wasn't kneeling down. If you put it there, he's got a three foot long axe. Well, it's a woodman's axe, three, two and a half foot three. So he's going to need a swing, so that's probably out there. That's it, an elm's out. Elm's out, that's it. The exhibition commemorated a legalised execution, carried out after the state trial of the Earl of Essex. But the tower has also been home to secret murder, the most notorious being of two boys, the princes in the tower. One night in 1483, a foul and stealthy deed was said to have taken place in this tower. An act so horrific that it has been known ever since as the Bloody Tower. <laughs> Two boys were held here under the supposed protection of their uncle, the man who is to become King Richard III. What happened to them was a turning point in British history. The cold-blooded murder of children, killed to win the throne of England. The boys were both the sons of Edward IV, who had died just a few weeks earlier. One was the new king, 12-year-old Edward V, awaiting coronation apparently safe in the tower. The other was his younger brother, the Duke of York. <laughs> Soon after their arrival at the tower, they were seen playing outside. But in time, they were spotted only rarely through the bars of the windows. By July 1483, they had disappeared. Nearly 200 years later, an unexpected discovery was made inside the tower. In 1674, workmen clearing away a stairway next to the White Tower discovered a box containing the bones of two children. All that remains here now is a wall plaque. When tourists started coming inside the Tower of London in numbers in the Victorian period, obviously all of the places of historical interest were pointed out to them, and one of the things in which there was most curiosity was this famous story of the bones of the princes in the tower. And so this plaque was put up, and the text of it makes out that, as I say, the tradition of the tower has always pointed out this as the stair under which the bones of Edward V and his brother were found in Charles II's time. The bones discovered in the tower were moved to Westminster Abbey, where they have continued to fascinate historians. Now it was King Charles II who in 1678 arranged for these bones to be buried amongst their ancestors in Westminster Abbey and who erected this urn with its impressive inscription. The Latin text on the tomb makes it quite clear that Charles II believed Richard III was the guilty man. Here lie the remains of Edward V, King of England, and of Richard, Duke of York. 
their uncle Richard, who usurped the crown, shut up these two brothers in the Tower of London, smothered them with pillows, and ordered them to be dishonorably and secretly buried. If we could prove that they are the princes and that they died at the ages which they would have been in 1483, then I think we can reasonably suppose that Richard III was responsible for their deaths. Today, this is still a very hot issue. And even in the face of so much circumstantial and actual evidence against Richard III, there are still many people who feel, yes, he was a nice person, he had qualities, he couldn't possibly have murdered the princes. I'm afraid the evidence points the other way. This is not the view of some of Richard III's supporters, who were also visiting the Abbey today. Well, we're members of the Richard III Foundation, and we're here today to lay a wreath in memory of King Richard III. Well, today it's his 549th birthday, <laughs> and we're here because we feel his life is worth celebrating because he was a man who believed in justice and was himself denied justice. There is not one shred of proof that Richard murdered his nephews in the tower. Nothing in nearly 500 years has come to light to prove it. Um, we believe that Richard was a victim of Tudor propaganda. There are two key questions about the bones at Westminster. Are they those of the princes and can they prove the date when they were killed? In 1933, the bones were taken out and examined in the Abbey by physicians. The conclusion? That the size and development of the bones pointed to the older child being aged 12 to 13 and the other aged 9 to 11. This tallies with the ages of the princes if they were murdered in 1483, the likely date if Richard III killed them. The structure of the jaws also pointed to them being related. Since this examination, archaeological science has moved on and people are calling for the urn to be reopened. What needs to be done is DNA testing on these bones because we need to prove a familial genetic link between these bones and the bones of other members of the family. And some are buried in St George's Chapel, some in Westminster Abbey. And the prince's sister, Catherine Plantagenet, is buried in Tiverton Chapel in Devon. So the princes may have a DNA connection in Devon. But just as mystery surrounds the princes, there's also a big question about where the bones of their sister, Catherine Plantagenet, may lie. It's known she was buried in this church, but the exact location is lost. Archaeologist Tim Young has arrived with equipment to investigate beneath the surface. Like the princes in the tower, Catherine was a child of King Edward IV. She was a royal princess and had taken the title Countess of Devon. Local historian Michael Martin believes that an eyewitness account of her burial points to the likely location of her tomb. The hope is that the plinth is undisturbed in its original position and that does fit, as I say, with the description not only of where the princess wished to be buried, but also the detailed accounts that were given by the two heralds who conducted her funeral Michael believes that a later tomb was placed on top of Catherine Plantagenet's, but that hers is still below. On the lower plinth, there are carvings that could represent the Plantagenet dynasty. The only way to see inside the tomb without disturbing it is with a fibre optic video camera, searching beneath the upper tomb. The hope is to find a lead shroud containing Catherine's preserved remains. This could provide a vital DNA connection with the bones in Westminster Abbey. We've got some lovely clear images here. We've got mm. the base now here yes. of this upper frieze. Right. So it's perfectly smooth in a surface to that. I'm with you. And then moving on down, we can see that the northern top is sloping outwards. And this is the point at which we're getting down almost to under the floor level. Almost there, down so. to under the floor levels. But then we're looking on much, and then, much below that. Aren't and then we? down it's into down. a jumble. And it looks to me as if we've got at least one coffin very close to the north wall, yes. with the top inclined, perhaps buried and maybe filled with straw. 
That extending across to the south in a room jumble of planks. We can't see the bottom of it at the moment. No, we can't. But there is no clear visual evidence to confirm if one of these is Catherine's coffin. Yeah, there's clearly more research needed. Nonetheless, nothing I've seen today would, would, would alter the, um, you know, the possibility uh, that we are looking at the princess's tomb here. The search for Catherine's tomb is just a small step in a mystery that's lasted over 500 years. A DNA comparison with her supposed brothers in Westminster Abbey could confirm once and for all whether this urn really does contain the princes in the tower. But will this ever clear the name of Richard III? This is a murder mystery, and there are many, many blind alleys up which one can travel in trying to sort it out and find a solution. But I have to say that these blind alleys lead nowhere and that we come back to the essential facts that all the evidence that we have, circumstantial and real evidence, points to Richard being the murderer of the princes in the tower. Richard only held the throne for two years. In 1485, he met a violent death himself on Bosworth Field at the hands of Henry Tudor. He has left no grave. The poignant story of the princes in the tower has formed part of the romantic and often morbid history of these buildings, where it's often hard to separate reality from myth. Much of this was invented in the 19th century. The defining moment was probably 1840 with the publication of this book by Harrison Ainsworth, The Tower of London, A Historic Romance. Thick volume based around the rise and fall of Lady Jane Grey. Here you will find references to the, the soil being soaked with the best blood in the country, etc., etc. This is what they came to see. A Tower of London, which was first and foremost a grim fortress prison. And this confused the real and the fiction, but in the process became everyone's idea of what the Tower of London was all about. The heroine of Harrison Ainsworth's lurid tale was Lady Jane Grey, queen for just nine days in 1554. Edward VI was dead. Powerful Protestants wanted one of their own to take the throne instead of Mary Tudor, Henry VIII's Catholic daughter. Fifteen-year-old Jane was thrust into the limelight and proclaimed queen at the tower. She failed to get enough popular support and was quickly surpassed by Mary. The tower became her prison. After six months in captivity here, Jane paid with her life. It was an image the Victorians loved. This famous painting of her execution was created by the Frenchman Paul de la Roche. But just how accurate a scene did the artist create for his Victorian audience? We have an anonymous description by someone who saw the real bloody events unfold. What this account makes clear, first of all, is that Lady Jane Grey is executed outside. She isn't executed in a, in a cellar or in a, a, in a sort of dripping room full of, um, full of ancient architecture, as is shown in that painting, but it does happen outside. And the account says that uh, the scaffold on which she's executed was made upon the green over against the White Tower. So this means it's somewhere in the area in front of me here, there's the White Tower. This is what remains of the, of the Tower Green in front of me now. So this event is not taking place in the seclusion of a dark corner of the tower, but it's happening very publicly in the most open area that there is in the tower. However, having said all of that, um, the account that we have of this execution is actually extraordinary because what it shows us is that that moment that Delaroche is dramatising in the painting of Lady Jane Grey fumbling for the block with her, with her, her blindfold on, is actually exactly what happened on that day. And my suspicion is that Delaroche had read the account that there is of this moment and is dramatizing it in that painting. She tied the kerchief about her eyes, then feeling for the block said, what shall I do? Where is it? One of the standers by guided her there. 
she laid her head down upon the block and stretched forth her body and said, Lord, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And so she ended. So although your suspicion might be on first looking at that painting that it is a completely Victorian concoction, actually it seems that it is really trying to give an impression of that actual moment that does happen here when Lady Jane Grey is executed. So surprisingly, the melodrama of Delaroche's painting is not far from the real events at the execution of Lady Jane Grey 280 years earlier. However, not all Victorians were as careful to get their facts right. One of the most famous, this fellow, the executioner's mask, mysteriously appeared on display by about 1850, and for over 100 years this was shown with the blocking of the axe as the mask that the executioner wore. It's been looked at in more recent times, it's clearly a fake. It's now back in the cupboard awaiting a display on Victorian fakes. Even so, visitors are still fascinated by tales of death and torture. But how widespread was it? And what really happened when Guy Fawkes was brutally interrogated here in the tower? The head became bird food, raven food, because these carnivorous birds they would land on the necks, peck at the flesh, the fresh meat, the blood and the veins, the eyes and the tongue. And the, the Yeoman Warder tour of the tower has always featured tales of execution and torture. It has continued to be the specialist subject of retired Yeoman Warder Bud Abbott. Torture is not a punishment, simply a persuasive method. And so the main instrument of persuasion was, of course, the rack. The victim had the ankles and wrists secured, a windlass and axle at each end which was turned outwards, stretching the victim and by degrees dislocating his ankle joints, knee joints, shoulders. The pain was so ex excruciating that eventually, whether he'd committed the deed or not, he confessed. The tire rack we know by the end of the 18th century had been on display, but it had, was falling to pieces with age, and quite what happened to it, no one knows. So deprived of this, this object, the Victorian curators resorted to making racks, and we have in the Royal Armouries collection of four of these Victorian miniatures, ridiculous things, all showing women on the rack, a reference to the racking of a woman, Anne Askew, during the reign of Henry VIII. The only time, I believe, a woman was racked in England. A rather sordid and unhealthy interest to Victorian visitors in the 19th century. And I understand that at one stage they even had a full-scale replica of the rack with a woman on it in the White Tower. But real torture was always illegal without the monarch's consent, given only in extreme circumstances. 6th of November, 1605, was one of the most extreme. Guy Fawkes had been caught red-handed trying to blow up the Houses of Parliament with King James inside. But this picture shows the whole gunpowder plot gang. At first, the authorities had no idea who Guy Fawkes' co-conspirators were. They were desperate to discover who else was involved. Inside the tower, they set about getting Fawkes to tell them. King James wrote a letter. For such a desperate fellow, the gentler tortures are to be used first unto him, and so by degrees proceeding to the worst. There is no record of precisely how Fawkes was tortured, but in keeping with other interrogations of the time, it probably began with the manacles and proceeded in stages to the rack. The evidence of his suffering remains in Guy Fawkes' own handwriting. A copy is kept in the Queen's house, the home of the governor, Major General Geoffrey Field. Not Surprisingly, he admitted his part in the plot. He couldn't really do otherwise. He'd been 
literally caught red-handed. Yeah. And there's his signature on the um, the indictment. Oh, yeah. This is a. Well, this was it was that the Guy Fawkes' signature? Mm. But I think I understand it was signed on a document on the indictment, probably before he was tortured. Horrible conspirator. Yeah. But then after he'd been tortured, we've got, and it's very difficult to see, but you can just about make out Guido oh, yes, that's a G here, there, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, of someone who's clearly in a pretty bad state. Eventually he cracked and revealed the names of the rest of the gang. The then lieutenant of the tower commemorated the breaking of the gunpowder plot with a wall plaque in the Queen's house. The inscription nowadays would be an incitement to religious intolerance. It goes, starts off by talking about our wonderful king, and then it goes on nefarious and cupidious Jesuit Romans, perfidious Catholics, Catholics yes. impiet, um, Im impiet vipers, etc. <laughs> you know, and it, it's pretty strong stuff. And, and then you've uh, got the name of all the plotters. Right, there, well, then, then that's, there are 26 names, including Guy Fawkes. People always ask about this Hebrew quotation here. He discovereth deep things out of darkness and bringeth to light the shadow of death. So there, I don't think there was any sense that they were trying to get rid of the monarchy, but they just wanted to have somebody who was, who was going to be Catholic and who was yeah. going to, or at least was going to make be more real tolerant. concessions to Catholics. Yeah. But it was pretty drastic measures. I mean, yeah. blowing up the entire nobility. <laughs> I mean, it's not just the king, the king, the queen, the prince of Wales, and every single member of the House yeah. of Lords. It is mind-boggling how, yeah. how nearly this, this yeah. actually worked yeah. and how completely different the course of history would have been if it had worked. Completely different. Sort of one of those big what-ifs, you know. What if the princes <laughs> in the tower hadn't been murdered? What if the gunpowder plotters had been successful? After his torture and trial, Fawkes was executed at Westminster. He received the traditional grisly penalty for treason, as this contemporary illustration gorily reveals. All the gunpowder plotters were hanged, but then taken down before they died. Their genitals were cut off, their hearts ripped out, and they were beheaded and cut into quarters. Their indignity went beyond death. Their heads were put on public display. For hundreds of years, there's only one bridge crossing the river at London, and it was known as the Bridge. And anyone coming in from the south or from the continent entering the capital had to come over the bridge. And on doing so, they looked up and saw these scores of heads and a few odd quarters. And that was a deterrent, a warning. Behave yourself in the capital. Just eight years after the gunpowder plot, the tower was again the site of secret suffering. A gruesome death that was the result of sexual intrigue in the royal court. In the 17th century, the art of poisoning was well developed. The perfect way to kill a rival for the king's affections. King James I had an eye for handsome young men. One of his favourites was Robert Carr, an ambitious and devious man. Carr's lover in turn was Sir Thomas Overbury. But things went horribly wrong when he gave up Overbury and married a court beauty. Overbury tried to ruin Robert Carr's reputation but he was silenced by being locked up in the tower. Once he was shut away, his enemies set about slowly poisoning him. At the hands of his killers, Overbury was to suffer a slow and agonizing death over six months. If Sir Thomas Overbury were poisoned today, there are a whole lot of secure mechanisms for investigating deaths through coroners. And we'd have samples of blood, samples of urine, and we'd be looking at them in the toxicology laboratory. But we do know just what Overbury's 17th century enemies used to kill him. The details are included in their confessions. An innocuous looking powder was sprinkled instead of salt onto Sir Thomas's food. It was white arsenic. Almost certainly Sir Thomas Overbury had uh, gastrointestinal effects from his arsenic poisoning. <coughs> Persistent vomiting and diarrhea 
and he would have been, after several months, in a fairly desperate stage of wanting anything that might help those symptoms. <coughs> so this amount of arsenic is enough to kill one person. Next, Sir Thomas was fed what was known as powder of diamonds. His gut is already pretty raw, and on top of that, he's been given this ground glass type of substance that will just cause bleeding from mouth through to stomach. Very unpleasant. After that, the poisoners use cantharides, a ground up insect. In small amounts, it was considered an aphrodisiac, but in large doses, it could be lethal. Onion sauce was on Sir Thomas's menu. Instead of pepper, it contained cantharides. It would make his mouth numb and irritated and unpleasant um, and could irritate the rest of his gastrointestinal system. <coughs> the final nail in Sir Thomas's coffin was mercury poisoning. He was given a mercuric bichloride enema ostensibly to make these symptoms better but in fact it worsened his poisoning and resulted in his demise because mercury is directly corrosive to the gut and also causes kidney failure. After six months imprisoned in the tower, Sir Thomas Overbury could endure no more. By the time of his death, Sir Thomas must have been a particularly gruesome, ghastly sight, and almost certainly they would have wished to have disposed of the body at an early stage. Overbury was buried within the tower's walls in the chapel of St. Peter ad Vincula. I think if I'd issued the death certificate on Sir Thomas Overbury, I'd have put down death by poisoning, secondary to both arsenic and mercuric bichloride. King James himself began to question what happened to Overbury. The lieutenant of the tower and the cook were tried, found guilty and executed. But Robert Carr was pardoned by the king and served just five years at the tower. Some believe James I wouldn't sign his death warrant for fear that secrets would be revealed that might lead to the king's downfall. Overbury's killing gained rapid notoriety. It's all there in the tower's register of births, marriages, and deaths. And the year 1613, in the burial section, it says, Sir Thomas Overbury, prisoner, poisoned, buried the 15th of September, 1613. Now that's very, very unusual in the register of St. Peter ad Vincula in that most of the entries don't actually say how the person died. It really does prove once and again that the register of births, marriages and deaths for the Tower of London really is not quite the same as a similar document for any other parish church in England. Overbury suffered a cruel, private murder inside the Tower. But others were to meet a far more public end just outside. Executed in front of vast crowds to make a grand and very clear political point. How about a story of blood and gore? Yeah. <laughs> blood and gore it is then, you morbid lot. Despite its gory reputation, only seven people were beheaded within the Tower of London. But when the authorities really wanted to drive the message home to the public, the execution would take place outside the walls on Tower Hill. In 1685, this was the fate of the Duke of Monmouth. The Duke of Monmouth, he was taken from here up to Tower Hill for his execution, which, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, proved to be the bloodiest execution ever to have been witnessed on Tower Hill. Just nine days earlier, Catholic King James II had destroyed the armies of the Protestant Dukes of Monmouth and Argyle in the Battle of Sedgemoor. Now, Monmouth was paying the very public price for trying to overthrow the king. It took five blows of the axe and a butcher's knife to finally sever his head. 
A public execution like this was designed to make it clear to everyone just who was boss and what the penalty for challenging the king's rule was. To drive the point home, King James II also produced a commemorative medal. You can see the heads of the Duke of Monmouth and the Earl of Argyll on the plinths, and underneath their headless corpses have the serpent of sedition writhing around. Over here on the right, you can see their heads on poles over some sort of fortification. And on the other side are thunderbolts descending on the defeated armies. Justice is holding in her left hand the scales which hold James's crown and a pile of uh, weapons captured from the defeated. And if you didn't pick up on all this imagery, down below, the Latin legend translates as ill-advised ambition falls. Beyond the tower's walls, over 150 people are known to have been executed here, on Tower Hill's very public scaffold. Whereas Monmouth apologised on this spot for his rebellion, two Scottish lords went defiantly to their deaths and used the scaffold to rewrite history. The Jacobite rebels, the Earl of Kilmarnock and Lord Balmerino, were captured after the defeat at Culloden. Tradition has it that Kilmarnock was imprisoned in the Byward Tower. Today it is the home of Yeoman Warder Alan Kingshot. Well, it's, it's actually a fantastic place to live, it really is. I mean, there's my house there, the Byward Tower. And to think that, you know, years ago, hundreds of years ago, it was used as a prison. I mean, it's fantastic, really. This room here now where we are is our main bedroom. It's one of the most unique rooms within um, where we live within the Biowa Tower. Uh, and we enjoy it here. Um, no longer a prison, I might add, despite the bars on the window. When Kilmarnock was held here, he wrote a final private letter. Tower of London, August 16th, 1746. My wife is what I leave dearest behind in the world, and the greatest service you can do for your dead friend is to contribute as much as possible to her happiness in mind and in her affairs. Your humble servant, Kilmarnock. But Kilmarnock's last words were going to be very public. Jeff Parnell has brought Professor Murray Pittock of Strathclyde University to see where Kilmarnock was held. Cross. Those fellows there. So it's sort of built to keep people in. But it's uh, interesting to think that it could have been this very room where Kilmarnock had his, uh, his last meeting with Balmerino, which led them to agree to publicly from the scaffold um, attack the official government uh, uh, version that the Jacobites had offered no quarter to government soldiers before Culloden, and that that version of events would be the basis for what they, would, what they would say on the verge of death, and which is now, of course, the accepted historical version. These Jacobite lords were determined to use the very public nature of their execution to promote their cause, and set the record straight in their dying speeches. Like many tower executions, the death that awaited them lay at the heart of the politics of the day. To the authorities, these were enemies of the state, who deserved only one fate, but they made the most of their last moments in the public gaze. This is the bound booklet of the dying speeches of the lords and various other executed Jacobites with an engraving in the front of Kilmarnock. The documents record that even as they faced the axe, the lords told the crowds they stood adamantly by their Jacobite beliefs and repeated their accusations of British atrocities in Scotland. These statements were so contentious that the authorities tried to suppress them. The official document actually censors Balmerino's speech, in particular quite heavily, not only by putting in asterisks when he <laughs> praised the King James, <laughs> Prince Charles and Henry Duke of York, but also by shortening his attack on the political establishment in England, which is printed out in full in the earlier paper. Despite the efforts of the British authorities, they couldn't hide what the mass crowds had already heard on Tower Hill. Kilmarnock and Balmerino may have been executed, 
but their dying speeches were to change future generations' view of history forever. But other executions were deliberately concealed from the public behind the walls of the tower. It wasn't only history celebrities who were executed here. This was also the place to kill spies and mutineers quietly. One of the most forgotten happened outside this tower chapel in 1743. Against this wall, three Scottish deserters met their deaths by firing squad. The Highland Regiment had been summoned to London to be presented to the King. A rumour circulated amongst them that they were being shipped off to the colonies instead. 101 of them turned around and started marching back home. They were intercepted and brought back to the tower, where the three ringleaders were separated and condemned to be executed by firing squad in private, watched by their comrades. They had to kneel there and after having been comforted by their spiritual advisers, they were told to pull the caps down over their eyes and remain still. Their other comrade mutineers, 98 of them, were drawn up in a big horseshoe to witness the fate of their mutinous colleagues. All three men had been ordered to put on shrouds beneath their uniforms so they would be ready for their graves. The firing squad assembled behind the chapel. 18 soldiers in three ranks advanced on tiptoes and with the least noise possible. Out of hearing, they cocked their weapons for fear of the click disturbing the prisoners. As a signal to present arms, Sergeant Major Ellison waved a handkerchief. After a very short pause, he waved it a second time as a signal to fire. All three fell instantly backwards as dead. The officers appeared greatly affected and the Scotch guards, many of whom were of the hardened sort, were observed to shed tears. So this was the very spot here where the three Scottish mutineers knelt and were shot to death by the firing squad. Here on this spot there is no plaque, nothing to remember the fate of those poor Scottish soldiers. A tragic story in the history of not only the British army but of the tower itself. The Scottish mutineers are some of the forgotten dead of the tower. Over its 900-year history, few people have been executed within these walls. But the famous executions and killings have earned their place in British history. These are some of the great turning points in the nation's past. Because of this, it's unlikely these buildings will ever lose their bloody reputation. <laughs>